And uh, so our penultimate talk of the day, I love that word, um, is uh, Daniela Wellish. Uh, thank you. She has a fan club. <laughs> um, I met Daniela when we were both working at Pivotal Labs. And she's now at Shares Post, right? Um, and uh, she studied math in college. And uh, she's going to talk to you today about um, the equivalence theorem between <laughs> testing and math proofs. <laughs> is, is, that a, is that random enough for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, the title of my talk, uh, Why is a Math Proof Like a Unit Test? Um, uh, I, pick, I picked it because it reminds me of a quote by the mathematician Charles Dodgson, why is a raven like, the, or like a writing desk? Um, and if you recognize that one, it's because it's from Alice in Wonderland, and Dodgson is, in fact, Lewis Carroll. Um, so the original mock riddle didn't have an answer, but maybe this question will. Uh, first, let me tell you a bit about myself. Uh, so my name's Daniela Wellish, as Josh said, and um, I've only been uh, programming really for about a year and a half um, and before that and since I was very young I always knew that I wanted to be a mathematician <laughs> so um, so here's what I love about math um, I'm the girl on the right saying, oh, hey, I didn't see you guys all the way over there. Because mathematicians live in a world that's based on concept and that they build using a s defined set of logical principles. Um, so they don't really need to think about the world of science or reality, because um, they're off in their own little world. There's a joke about a mathematician, an engineer, and a physicist who all get stuck in burning motel rooms. One night, the, um, the engineer wakes up, sees that his hotel room's on fire, um, and notices that there's a bucket and a faucet. So he starts pouring buckets with, or filling buckets with water and pouring them on the fire until the fire goes out. Then he goes back to sleep. The next night, the physicist wakes up, uh, sees that his motel room's on fire, calculates exactly how much water he needs to put on the fire for it to go out, he pours that much water on the fire, the fire goes out, he goes back to sleep. The third night, the mathematician wakes up, sees that his room's on fire, looks at the bucket, looks at the faucet, says, ah, a solution exists, and goes back to sleep. <laughs> so this demonstrates that mathematicians live in the world of concept, and they don't have to care about the actual solution to a problem rather than the uh, context of a problem. Um, so this is what I love. I love this about math. So I was studying math and loving it until I realized that academia wasn't for me. And so I ran off with my BA and looked around to see what I could do that I enjoyed in quite the same way. That's when I went to a Rails bridge. Um, and I know that most of you probably heard about Rails bridge today or in the past, but it's a day and a half workshop that aims to get underrepresented, underrepresented groups into Rails. And um, I met mentors there who were agile developers and convinced me to start using TDD immediately. So I started testing from pretty much the ground up. Um, and, uh, and then I quickly found myself an agile job that I loved. So. Um, the fact that this transition happened so quickly made me wonder what it was about TDD uh, that, made, that made me so happy and made me love things, love what I was doing the same way that I felt that when I was studying math. So one day I was coding with my pair and we came across one of those nifty recursive problems that's even more fun in Ruby when you have all those loopy methods to draw from namely turning this hash of hashes into this array of arrays. Um, and after we finished our implementation and finished our, per, uh, finished our story and started running rake, we got to talking. Um, now, my pair hadn't studied any math formally. In fact, he majored in dance. So he was curious if when I studied math, 
I'd encountered much recursion. Of course I studied recursion. <laughs> Math is filled with recursion. And recursion itself So recursion itself is a mathematical concept that's based on something called induction. Um, side note, for the, property, uh, for the purposes of this talk, when I say induction, I mean mathematical induction. And when I say integer, I'm only going to talk about positive integer. Um, so <laughs> yes, if you're laughing, you probably care about this distinction. <laughs> and if you're not laughing, then you don't have to worry about it. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about induction. Um, induction is a way of proving things about the integers um, where you first prove a, prove a property is true for one and then show that it, if it is true for some arbitrary integer n, then it's true for n plus one. As you may have noticed from some of the liberties I've taken in my proof, induction is not actually possible in RSpec. But I'll get back to that. <laughs> but I'll get back to that later um, after we talked about induction a bit more. So when you prove something is true for n plus one based on being true for n, basically essentially you're saying that if it's true for one, then it's true for two. So if it's true for two, it's true for three. Therefore, recursively, it's true for every integer. Um, so uh, you, uh, there are some methods in my mock uh, proof or mock test that I haven't defined yet, so let's talk about them for a second. Um, how many of you remember studying or learning summation notation? All right. Lots of hands, but some people aren't raising theirs. So, sorry, I got mail. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> uh, uh. What? Oh, I'm really. Sorry, guys. Uh, what are we? <laughs> um, I'm closing these tabs. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, let's make this big again. And now we're all happy. All right. <laughs> so I've messed up once, so I'll be fine for the rest of the talk. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, summation notation, um, sometimes called sigma t notation, is a mathematical loop where you add up whatever's to the right of the sigma, which is the zigzag Greek letter. Um, you start um, your, your where you start and the uh, variable you're using in your loop are on the bottom of the sigma, and at the top of the sigma you have your upper bound. Um, I put a Ruby implementation there. Uh, you might be saying, why are you using recursion instead of inject? But I mentioned recursion, so I'm using recursion. <laughs> um, so what, what are we trying to prove? We're trying to prove that the sum of the first n numbers is n times n plus 1 over 2. This is one of the classic problems of um, number theory or, uh, or classic problems of number theory and is one of the first things that students solve when learning induction for the first time. So the first person to ever encounter this probably started by idly adding up numbers and then noticed this property emerge. So he wondered, hey, does this happen for every integer? Um, and you can, try to, you can convince yourself that this works if you look at um, two triangles, each of whom has um, a number of dots equal to the sum of the first seven integers. Um, so if you put put the triangles together, you'll end up with a rectangle that has the number of dots equal to, um, equal to twice the number of dots in either triangle. So you get a rectangle with seven columns and eight rows, so the number of dots is seven times eight, so the number of dots in either triangle is half of that. Um, there's a story that goes along with this property about the mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss. When he was a little boy, uh, he was a really precocious child and annoyed his teacher to no end by constantly getting any problem put towards him immediately and never giving his, his teacher a moment's peace. So one day in order to try to shut him up for a bit, 
His teacher added, asked him to add up the first 100 numbers. And before his teacher could even pause to take a breath, Gouts shouted out, 5,050! Because he understood intuitively that the sum of the first 100 numbers is 100 times 101 over 2. So now that we know what we're trying to prove a bit more, let's uh, look at it using induction. So where do we start? We start by seeing if this holds for the sum of the first one numbers. So the sum of the first one numbers is just one, which is half of two, so that works. Um, all right, so the next step is to look at it, is to assume that it's true for some arbitrary integer n. So assuming that it's true for n, we want to show that it's true for n plus 1. That is, that the sum of the first n plus 1 numbers is n plus 1 times n plus 2 over 2. So let's start by say, looking at the sum of the first n plus 1 numbers. And that's really just n plus 1 plus the sum of the first n numbers. So the um, expression that represents the sum of the first n numbers has shown up again. So we can just replace that with the assumption we've made about it. And um, essentially, we still have a failing test because um, even though we have n plus 1 plus n times n plus 1 over 2, and that looks close enough to where we're trying to go, we don't have a computer here to do all the little in-between steps for us. I mean, yeah, there's a computer here, but... <laughs> um, so we have to keep going, and we have to iterate until we get green. <laughs> So then the uh, sum of the first n plus num one numbers is if you turn the first argument into a fraction, 2 times n plus 1 over 2 plus n times n plus 1 over 2, and then you can put those together and flip around the order of the uh, addition to get n times n plus 1 uh, plus 2 times n plus 1 all over 2. Um, and we're close, but we still need to look at where we're trying to go and say, am I there yet? Um, have, I, have, I reached what, have I reached the point where I'm tr that I'm trying to get to? And we haven't yet. So we pull out the n plus 2, and then we get n plus 2 uh, times n plus 1 over 2. So if we flip those around, then we're green. <laughs> and we've proven We've proven this property holds for all integers because it's true in general for some arbitrary integer, or for n plus 1, given that it's true for some arbitrary integer. Um, so let's take a little break. <laughs> um, yeah, so and there, we proved this property, and there was much rejoicing. <laughs> um, so anyway. Now that we've proven this, why doesn't this work in our spec? Let's go back to our um, let's go back to our mock proof. If you notice, when you get to that line that says n equals integer dot, dot new, something weird happens. We get an, a no method error about this I uh, method integer dot new because we can't do that. We can't just create an arbitrary integer. So this test doesn't compile and it doesn't work. So in order to get past this line, we have to do something impossible. Um, so why is this impossible? And why do we even need this impossible step in the first place? Um, so let's first look at why is it impossible, or why is it impossible? Um, when you add, uh, uh, when you if you want to try to do this in our spec, you can pick um, you can pick specific integers. For instance, you can pick seven and say, "Well, it works for seven, therefore it works for eight. But that doesn't show that it works for anything. And even if you loop through twenty numbers and do this twenty times, it still doesn't prove uh, prove it works for an arbitrary contextless number. And even if you pick random numbers. A random number doesn't stand in for any number because um, 
showing that it works for random numbers only shows that it works for numbers within the bounds that you give it that pop out of your random number generator. Um, so why do we need this context list number in the first place? Uh, the a programmer's concept, uh, concept of an integer and a, mathema a mathematician's concept of an integer are different. Programmers build, it, programmers build the integers one way, and for a mathematician, you build up the integers using axioms, like small, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> small, small things that, sorry, <laughs> small things that seem obvious, but you have to assume in order to make your, your system work. For instance, one of the axioms that you use to build the integers is there exists zero. Um, and so somewhere in the mathematical source code of the integers, there lies the uh, axiom of induction, which says that if you have a set S that has zero in it, and if it has some N in it, then, it's, then N plus one is also in that set, then that set is essentially in is essentially, in fact, the integers. Sorry, I didn't change it to say integer, uh, integers instead of natural numbers. But um, <laughs> uh, so basically, mathematicians build the integers this way, such that this works. Um, and when you have um, when <laughs> when you have uh, the uh, when you Build integers using like your finite amount of RAM. You can't really say, I'm going to have these things that work recursively on forever, and because of that, I can stub something out that means anything. Um, so you may have, re you may remember um, the phrase, everything in Ruby is an object. Um, and now, Alex, please don't tweet. <laughs> um, so everything in Ruby is an object, which means everything in Ruby is an instance of something. For instance, seven is a specific instance of integer, and it comes with all of this baggage for being, being an integer. Because in mathematics, we're really kind of looking for platonic ideals, and an object is not a platonic ideal. So for instance, with seven, um, like I said, seven comes with all this baggage. For one, it's prime. It's also one more than six. And it's one less than eight. Eight's a cube, so who knows what sort of kinky shit seven gets into for being a Mersenne prime. So you can't really let seven represent any number. <laughs> um, so where does this get us? Um, the same thing happens if we're writing a spec I know that you can say, oh, but we have some classes where we can just define initialize, so we can say class get dot new and get an instance of that class that stands in for anything. But that doesn't mean that you don't have special cases or something like that. For instance, this spec, if you have something that, uh, the, if you have something where you're unit testing this eat mushroom uh, method, um, and you test it for a user named Alice. Um, just because it works for Alice and makes Alice bigger doesn't mean that if you make a user named Bob, he'd behave the same way. For instance, Bob might get smaller when he eats the mushroom. So you can't, you, uh, so basically, um, <laughs> basically your uh, test suite isn't a proof that your code works. Um, and it's important to understand what, what function it, um, what function it really provides if it doesn't work. And so unit tests are heuristics rather than proofs. So <laughs> uh, a heuristic is, when you, so when you use a heuristic, you use it to study the methods and rules of discovery and invention. Um, so there's a mathematician named George Polia who wrote a book called How to Solve It which is an attempt to revive heuristic in mod a modern and modest form. And um, so <laughs> heurist uh, he, um, sorry. 
So he talks a lot about things about heuristics that make sense when you think about what we do if we test drive a problem. For instance, something he says in his book is that it is foolish to answer a question you do not understand. It is sad to work for an end you don't desire. So this basically means that before you solve a problem, you have to understand it. And every time we do test-driven development, say for instance you do outside-in TDD and start with your integration test, you make sure you know what problem you're trying to solve because you write a test that will fail if that doesn't work. Um, and another thing that he basically implies, but is a quote that's misattributed to him, um, is that if you can't solve a problem, then there's an easier problem you can't solve. Find it. Um, so this basically means that uh, you have to break problems down into smaller and smaller chunks until you arrive at the simplest problem and the easiest problem to solve. And we do this too. Um, this, this might look familiar, like when we get fa test failures, we use them to tell us what to do next and what we should do next. So um, heuristics play a valuable role in, in helping us figure, guide us through our problems. Um, and uh, Polia under, uh, stressed the fact that heur heuristics were not proofs and, could not sh and it was dangerous to look on them as proofs. But he, sti he still said that we need heuristic reasoning when we construct a strict proof as we need scaffolding when, when we erect a building. Because um, heuristics are important as a guide. And understanding the steps it takes to solve a problem is important as a guide. So when I was taking some time off from college, I spent some time um, tutoring math to inner city kids in Los Angeles. And the Los Angeles Unified School District is nor n notoriously not awesome. So, um, <laughs> so if they, their teachers didn't necessarily understand what they were teaching the students. And it made it really hard for the students to understand what they were trying to learn. Um, but uh, at that point in my life, I'd already taken some number three, and I'd already taken some algebra. So I understood how you build a, n a number system mathematically and how you, um, and therefore I knew like the axioms that you could use in order to prove that you can do things in a certain way. And it, knowing those um, building blocks made it easier for me to explain to the students in different words and in words they could understand how to approach the problem they were solving when, for instance, that problem was um, adding up fractions or something like that. And this knowledge was really valuable. And um, in the same way, I think that understanding math and understanding the differences between a test suite and proofs is very important because First of all, it can, help you ex it can help you explain to other people what you're doing when you're test driving things. And it'll help you understand the gap between test driving and proving. For instance, you can figure out that your, you can figure out what you mean when you say full test coverage because you know that full test coverage doesn't mean my my test suite is proven. Um, so in conclusion, um, approaching tasks in small chunks is more logical and mathematical. Um, so you can use this to help you figure, uh, help you figure out logically what process you're using to prove something. Um, and test-driven development is a good tool for the mathematically minded. So for instance, if you have a friend who's very mathy and wants to learn to code, I would highly recommend um, Agile to them. And understanding the heuristics behind a subject increases our ability to impart knowledge. So thanks. <laughs> Um, 
Um, sure. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> what would you describe as the axioms of software development? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, interesting. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that one <laughs> threw me for a loop a bit there. I, I kind of feel like with software development, you have a computer at hand, and the computers build things using uh, essentially byte code or whatever, and they're built within the con confines of being, of being a Turing machine. So I think that something you need to understand implicitly when approaching software development is really where your boundaries are and what those boundaries are. Um, I, I'm sure I could think of more. <laughs> Sounds like a good conversation for the party tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. okay, great. Thank you very much, Danielle. <laughs> <Very good. laughs>